Hello and welcome to a session we're going to be doing on a clinical perspective on treating patients with trachs and vents. And my name is Kristen King and I am an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. And my background includes 14 years as a practicing speech pathologist where I worked in two level one trauma centers and frequently worked with patients on trachs and vents. And what I'm going to provide for you today is kind of an overview of trachs and vents and then talk a little bit about um, the effects of speaking valves and what we can provide as therapists. The course objectives today are to be able to identify the various types of trachs and speaking valves, including the primary advantages and disadvantages. We'll also be um, talking about trachs themselves with and without cuffs and include the impact on speech and swallowing. And I actually will be showing you some different trachs and uh, speaking valves and we'll um, get to play with those a little bit. And then I'll, we'll be able to, at the end, hopefully verbalize the basic, basic methods for evaluating speech and swallowing of trach patients, both with and without ventilators. So to start, what I wanna do is kinda of give you a brief introduction or overview of trachs um, as, them, as they exist. And we want to first think about why is it important that we see patients with trachs from a speech pathology standpoint. And the ability to communicate is a fundamental necessity of human existence. It's believed that the patient's quality of life is improved after restoration of such a basic human function. And some studies have actually been done to look at this and to address uh, quality of life and length of stay of patients. And it's been found that having basic communication skills available to them and allowing them to participate in their care uh, increases their quality of life and decreases their length of stay. And it's also been said that the isolation experienced due to difficulties to communicate is a greater problem than the direct airway related nursing care activities. That that lack of communication just has a significant impact. So a little history. Tracheotomy is one of the oldest surgical procedures. Um, it's actually portrayed all the way back on Egyptian tablets in 3600 BC. So just to give you an idea, it's been around a long time. The first successful tracheotomy was performed in the 15th century, and it was for a patient who had suffered a laryngeal abscess. And that patient actually survived and recovered after the procedure. And I always have to share this because I think it's funny. Guidi, um, the scientist, in the 1500s actually developed a method of tracheotomy and performed it at cocktail parties and social gatherings. It was actually something for fun. And if you go online and look him up, you can see pictures of, of his lovely cocktail party fun times. Now, we're going back a little bit more in history. George Washington, what does he have to do with a tracheotomy? Anybody have an idea? Oops. <laughs> see here. My slide is not showing again. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you. <laughs> George Washington, um, when he passed away, he was actually um, in bed, surrounded by his family, and was um, in the process of <coughs> passing. And it turned out that he passed from a severe respiratory complication that a tracheotomy might have caused him to survive. And his surgeon, his family doctor, surgeon who followed his care, knew how to do a tracheotomy, had actually um, had exposure and experience with one previous one. But because of George Washington's position and, and place in the world, he was afraid to take that chance and do a tracheotomy on, on him. So he did not perform it, and George Washington subsequently passed away. So uh, it affected his life significantly, and I just thought I would share that little side fact that he may have lived longer and done quite a bit more if his surgeon had followed through on it. So let me see if I can get off that slide. I show this slide, an 1800s antique silver trach, for a reason. Um, there is something that physicians use. It's a metal Jackson trach. You can see this one here. And if you notice, this one looks very similar to what you're seeing on the picture there. And I'll show it again in a little bit. But the metal Jackson, um, you see this picture here? Does it look like the one maybe I was just showing you a little bit? And this one's actually a Lures obdurator and cannula. And it's from the 1890s. And I show this because that's the 1890s. 
and we're in 2012. <laughs> I had to think for a second. And you can see that the metal trach looks very similar to what was used back in the 1890s. It's very old school, and we'll talk about that, and you're going to hear me referencing the metal trachs in the old school um, thought. But they are used, they do have their place, but, they're, um, but you will run into them, and surprisingly, historically, they're quite an old style of intervention. 